for Moti Lieberman. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to the conference organizers for um, inviting me to the event. Um, it's nice to be back here. I actually used to teach at Concordia for a bit before I started doing the Link Space, so um, it's nice to be back where I once was. So, We've been coming um, the past couple of years to Langfest as well, um, and they invited me this year to give a talk about linguistic stuff, and I thought, you know, we'll give a pretty broad overview of um, the kind of things that we look at. Um, so we're gonna look at for today, we'll start off just by sort of talking a bit about what a linguist is. Then we're gonna go into a bit of the underside of sentences, the underside of what we're doing with sounds and speech. Um, given the uh, talks that we have here and the general interest that I figure people have, we'll talk a bit about um, language acquisition stuff, and then we'll go through some final thoughts and we'll have some time for a question and answer. So just to give you the roadmap. Um, so what is language? Just writ broadly, right? You know, we use it in a lot of different ways. We think of language as a tool for communicating, right? We think of language as a tool that we use for thinking in our own minds, for communicating with ourselves. Um, we use language to make impressions on people, um, to make judgments for discriminating between different um, options. Unfortunately, people also use it for discriminating against each other. We'll try to avoid that part. Um, but we use it in a lot of different ways. We think of language as a tool often, right? When we're trying to learn a language, we're often focusing on it from this perspective, okay? But when we're talking about what goes into learning a language, all of those things that we're talking about are just uses, right? Those are things that we're trying to do with language, right? But that's not what language is underlyingly. Okay, those are just the things that we try to use language for. Okay? So what is language itself? It's a universal human property. All kids who are exposed to either spoken or signed language, um, assuming that they are neurologically typical, will pick it up. Right? They will pick up a language. Everybody um, exposed to a language as a child will pick up the language. Right? It's a system of rules that we build into our minds, right? and that can be rules for what we do with our sounds. It can be rules for what we do with our um, sentences, for what interpretations we can get. These are all the things that you're trying to learn when you're learning a language. And you use these to build a mental grammar, right? In all of these sorts of different sorts of ways, you're trying to build this system in your mind. That's what you're putting together, right? So what then is a linguist, right? A linguist is somebody who is studying and describing those systems or their interactions with the mind, self, or world, okay? So this is, I tried to come up with a definition that would capture stuff as well as we could, right? Um, a linguist is generally not somebody who says how you should use language, right? The point is to be descriptive, to say what people are actually doing with language and not try to tell people what they should be doing with language, right? Um, there's a t-shirt that a friend of mine has designed that says, not judging your language, just analyzing it. That's sort of the approach that we're looking at. Oh, we've got, are you wearing it? <laughs> or do you just know about it already? <laughs> cool. Um, it's a really good t-shirt. I'll show you at the end. Um, this is not a product placement. I just like the t-shirt. Um, and a linguist is also not necessarily somebody who speaks lots and lots of languages, right? I think that it's a benefit if you're multilingual, if you're going into linguistics, just because it gives you an idea of the different things that you can do. But there are a lot of prominent linguists who um, only really speak one language, um, Regularly, it's English, um, but there's a lot of, uh, like I've met linguists in Japan who basically only spoke Japanese. Um, that's the way that it goes. Because what you're trying to get at is what's underneath language, like the structures, the way that we deal with it, and less sort of the individual languages themselves, okay? Um, I will say, just as a side note, so my husband speaks way more languages than I do, right? He speaks like six or seven languages. I really speak two to two and a half, all right? So what goes into linguistics? Really, all the different things that you think about in language are things that we do cover within linguistics one way or another. So this ranges for theoretical stuff from phonetics, so the art, acoustics and articulation of sounds, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics. Um, again, I assume with this crowd, probably you're familiar with all these different parts already, right? So just building from sounds into like units of meaning and words, and then using those words to build sentences and getting interpretations from those sentences. Right, so this is more the theoretical side of linguistics. Right? We also have a lot of things in applied linguistics. So you have sociolinguistics and dialectology. You have historical linguistics, so language change and why language changes over time. What predictions we can make from historical linguistics as to what things are likely to change in the future. There's some really interesting stuff about what irregular words we expect to fall out of the language soon, things like that. Um, language acquisition either for children or for second or third or more language acquisitions as adults. Um, 
language processing and psycholinguistics. There's even really like linguistics is so broad because language touches on so many different parts of our lives, right? There's so many different things that go into language. It's a very complex system. And then there are so many things that we do with language, right? And all of those can fall within linguistics, right? So when we say, what does a linguist do? Well, it can be any of these things. It can be even more than this, right? It's a very broad field, okay? But I figured that just sort of leaving it at this kind of place was maybe not the most interesting. It's too abstract. So I thought maybe from here we can get into sort of some playing with a bit of language stuff for a bit. Okay, so we all have linguistic rules that are inside our minds that we don't necessarily think about or even know that we know, right? These things just happen. So when we take a sentence like Jane and Raphael expect to miss them, so who is them here? Can't really say, but it can't be Jane and Raphael, right? So it can't be that Jane and Raphael expect to miss themselves, right? Them has to be somebody different. We all agree? Yeah, great. <laughs> so how about, who do Jane and Raphael expect to miss them? How can we interpret this one differently? Yeah? How many of you have thought about this before? <laughs> so those, got a couple of hands, okay. So something has obviously changed about this, but all that we've really done here is that we made it into a question. We're asking, like, who is doing the expect, like, who, are, who do they expect to, mi to miss them, right? We've only like, introduced a couple of extra words, and yet now we have this interpretation available to us that we didn't have before, right? Okay, so what's going on here? This gets into a lot of syntax if you wanna talk about it, but the most basic sort of approach to it, right, is that in the first sentence, right, you kind of have this Jane and Raphael thing existing as the subject of the second part of the sentence, right? And there's a rule for them that you can't have it be associated with something that close to it. Right? It can't be in the same clause like that, in this sort of relationship. So um, in that case, if you want it to be them, it has to be themselves. Right? That's why if you want to say Jane and Raphael expect to miss themselves, it's a little bit of an awkward way to say something, but it feels fine. Right? If you're an English speaker, it should be okay. Um, but you can't have it be if it says miss them for that to work out. Right? But if you have, who do Jane and Raphael expect to miss them? What's going on in the, that subject down there is who, you've moved that who out, right? And now Jane and Raphael are far enough away. Do we have any Jane the Virgin fans here? Or is this, no, Ah, one, okay. <laughs> I always pick my example sentences from whatever TV show I'm watching at the time. I find that this is a good way to stay current. Um, all right. Now, all of you had this sense, right, that this is the way that these sentences could work, that these are the interpretations that are available to you, but you hadn't really thought about what's underneath it, right? So you know this syntactic rule, you know that this is something that has to apply to English, but you never really thought about what's going on underneath, right? Okay, and this is one of the things that linguists do. You play around with these sentences. You try to figure out what you can do and what you can't do with language, right? So what these rules tell us is what interpretations we can get what words we can move around in sentences, so what sort of questions we can ask. Like, you can't ask something like, what should we ask how the fence will stop, right? You can kind of see, if you think about it, where the what is coming. It's coming from down in the lower clause, but you can't actually ask this question, even if you can sort of figure out what it means, right? Again, there are syntactic rules that we have in English, and indeed, this is a universal across languages. You can't ask questions of this sort, right? Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Knowing, no, knowing that you were going to come and do it helped a lot. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I mean, the light on the thing was on. So, so moving away from 
sentences and going to the underside of speech, okay? So when we listen to speech and when we produce it, right, we don't have any problems with this, right? We know what our tongues should be doing. We know how to configure all the stuff that's going on in our mouths to make the sounds that we want, right? But what's actually happening underneath that? What are we actually paying attention to? What are we hearing? This is another thing that linguistics plays around and thinks about, okay? So this gets to a really nice question. What is sound, <laughs> all right? So we often talk about sound waves, right? And we talk about sound waves and we think kind of it's like the ocean or something where you have waves and they're sort of crashing and this water is moving around. That's not really what it works. It's not that like the air that's coming out of my mouth is like spraying all over the room and like getting in your ears. This is not the way that this happens, even with a microphone, right? This isn't the way that sound waves work. What it is is that at each individual molecule that is of air that's around you doesn't really move that much. What happens for when I'm talking is that it's basically doing stuff in my mouth, in my vocal tract, right, which causes different air pressures to come out. So things that are higher pressure, things that are lower pressure. So it's more kind of like this animation. Wow. Okay. That's sort of what sound waves look like, right? So you can see none of the molecules really move that much, right? It just, they more or less stay in place, but you can see the waves sort of traveling through them, this areas of like higher and lower pressure, right? So we're sensitive to these pressure fluctuations. We're really sensitive to them, right? We're really good at telling these things. Um, these very fast waves apart from one another, right? And if you think about the speed at which we talk, right? I had to do this for when we were making the YouTube videos. I actually went through and sort of averaged how fast I talk in the YouTube videos, and it's roughly 200 words a minute, right? That's a lot of words that we're throwing out there. And I'm not actually even the fastest person on YouTube by a long shot. <laughs> so for those of you who watch YouTube videos, you'll know there are people who talk a lot faster than me, right? And yet, if you're an English speaker, right, or if you're a speaker of whatever language you're watching the videos, and you don't have a problem decoding it, right? We're very good at sort of picking these things out, right? So this is a matter of audition, right, listening, and speech perception. But what are we actually listening for, right? What we're having to do is like we're paying attention to the changes, right, these minute changes that are happening in the incoming sound wave, right? And because we know that that's what we're paying attention to, when we're talking, right, we change the shape of our lips and where our tongue is and how our vocal folds are vibrating, right, in order to make um, these waves different, right, to make the sounds that are relevant, right? The test that I usually do for this, so you can kind of feel, have you ever done the S versus Z thing for sort of feeling some of you have, right? So just for feeling your vocal folds and the vibrations that happen, you can just put your fingers right over here on your throat, your Adam's apple, if you have one. Um, if you go you don't feel anything, right? There's no vibration. S is a sound that's made just with constriction further off in the vocal tract. Right? But if you make a zzz sound, so zzz, okay? So you can feel there's a difference in the vibration there, all right? So that's your vocal folds, right? One of the most interesting things I ever learned in linguistics is the same effect that drives that vibration in your throat is the same thing that makes airplanes fly. Same deal as the Bernoulli effect. It's this effect of sort of differential pressure blowing things apart and pulling them back together, right? So cool. Ah, I love phonetics. Um, anyway, so. This is what we're doing, right? All these little minute changes that we've created, that we create in our mouths, change the sound waves and we're like exquisitely attuned to this on the other side, right? Particularly what we listen to and what we're shaping our mouths for are making different parts of the sound wave sound stronger, right? In the track, like when we're seeing what's coming out, all right? So when you're shaping like your mouth in different ways, right? When, and we'll see this in a second, right? If you say something like, ah, versus saying something like E, all right? What you're doing is you're creating a different mouth shape, and that shape accentuates different parts of the sound wave that you're producing down in your vocal hold. So you have this wave that you're producing, right? And if you think about it, like if you have like a water bottle, you know, like a soda bottle or a beer bottle, right? With different levels of liquid in it, and you like blow across the top, right? It makes different pitches depending on how much liquid there is inside. This is basically what you're doing. It's the same mechanic, right? Depending on how much distance that you've created by moving your tongue further up or further down or further front or further back, right? And what you're doing with your lips, right? You actually make different parts of the sound wave more resonant, right? And therefore stronger. And we count those, right? So you have, these are known as formants. You count each one of them as you go through. Like you'll see they go up one at a time, 
All right. We're going to take a quick look at spectrograms. Have you seen spectrograms before? They're really fun and you should play around with them. I'll show you a tool you can play around with on your own at the end. Right, so what this is is on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have the frequency in the sound wave, and uh, the darkness is the amplitude. This is what phoneticists use for looking at visualizing speech. Okay? So what we can see here on the bottom, so this is just a waveform on the top, just the wave by itself. On the bottom we have the spectrogram. Right? So the darker bands right, are where we find sort of more noise. I want you to focus on the ahs, so you can kind of see um, sh versus s. We have differences in terms of like how high pitched the noise is. But if you look at the ah sounds, you can kind of see these darker bands, right? And these bands are sort of telling you what vowel it is. That's what we pay attention to, right? Mm, this might be more detailed than we have time to get into. So we'll move past that part of it. But um, we pay attention to, particularly for vowels and other sort of nasal sounds, L's, R's, et cetera, what's going on with these formants. That's what tells us what sound we're listening to, all right? And particularly, we pay attention to the first couple of them for vowels. Right? We pay attention to these because those two by themselves will, are enough to tell you what vowel it is you're listening to. Okay? So the, because it's essentially where you're putting your tongue. Right? How high your tongue is in your mouth, so you can feel sort of if you go like ah to e, like your tongue is a bit like it's higher for e than it is for ah. Right? This is why when you go to the dentist, the dentist is not like say e because then they can't see in the back of your throat. It's a problem. All right. Um, so this is, you have the F, like that's the height of the tongue, F2, the second formant, right? This is how far forward or back your tongue is, right? So you're shaping this sort of bendy tube that is your vocal tract, all right? These are a bunch of English vowels, so you can kind of see for the different ones, they're all produced in the same context. So these are all like heed, hid, head, had, hod, hawed, Right? Some of these are words and some of them aren't. But the idea here is you can kind of see these bands, these are what you're paying attention to. And look how different it is for something like E, where you have this really big difference between um, the height, which is your tongue is high in your mouth, right? so it's fairly low, versus it's pretty far front in your mouth, so the second formant is pretty high. Right? As opposed to something like ah, where the two of them are really close to each other. So these are the ones, the top left and bottom left. Right? So this is what you're doing, and this is what you pay attention to. Right? When you're listening to speech, right, what you're noticing for figuring out what sound it is you're listening to are these. All right? Okay? So if you've seen vowels, if you've looked at the IPA, if you've sort of talked about this sort of thing, right, you can actually map in English pretty carefully like all the different vowel sounds onto the traditional vowel chart. Right? They're a little bit unintuitive for the direction because sort of the higher numbers are going this way to make it work. But it basically maps properly. This shows you how good this is, right? This is a good tool also for figuring out what sounds it is you're listening to. If you get good at looking at spectrograms, you can figure out um, what sounds people are making. Phoneticists love this sort of thing. They put up, like I know phoneticists who put up like problem sets every week, like challenges, like figure out what I said in this sentence. Hey, here's a big spectrogram and then I'll send you a prize. Um, we have Q&A time at the end. Can we save it? Or do you have something specifically about this? Okay. <laughs> so why would it be, why is it a, a versus a, or? Um, I'm not sure I entirely, so, uh, okay, let's come back to this at the end. We can just come back to the slide, okay? Um, so F1 and F2 are really good for figuring out what the variation we're looking at for vowel quality. Um, but the challenge and why this isn't the most straightforward and you just memorize these things and you're done with it is that there's big interspeaker differences in formants, right? So the way that I speak is not the same way that somebody else speaks. If you speak a different language and you have more or less vowels in that language, right? The way that you're gonna carve off the vowel space in your mouth is gonna be different. If you think about it, so probably some of you have like Spanish or Italian or, I know some of you speak Spanish, <laughs> right? Or Japanese, right? So these are five vowel systems. So you have E, A, A, O, well Spanish has seven, but um, E, A, A, O, um, U, right? Yeah. And if you go look at those, you put them in different spaces, right? English has more vowels, so it's carving them up differently. Within a language, you see different usage, right? And of course, right, we're talking about the inside of your mouth, 
right? There is no like marker inside of your mouth for where one space starts and another one ends, right? If you move your tongue through your mouth, you won't feel anything in the middle of your mouth. Like you have to get to the roof of your mouth or your teeth or something, right, to feel something different there. So you're carving up a space and kind of like putting labels on it in a way that's like we're making discrete boundaries when they're not quite as discrete as that, right? So this means that we can't actually just sort of say this is the way that English is every time. This English sound, if you have an ah, then the formant value for the first formant is going to be 900 hertz every time, right? They're variable across speakers. They're variable across languages and dialects. And if you want to know more about this, I have bonus slides at the end. Um, and they're variable within speakers by the context that you're speaking in. Um, you can think about this in terms of how you talk to, say, like a three-year-old versus how you talk to like your boss or your grandmother. You use a different tone, a different register, and that changes the way that you make these sounds a bit, right? But it means that it can't be the same thing every time. Um, there have been some really big studies of this, so you can sort of see average across a whole bunch of different speakers from the 90s, um, how big these categories are for when people are trying to make these sounds, right? producing them in context. So you can't just sort of be like, this is the one perfect sound of this. We have to be able to recognize right, in any individual speech like what the sound is that the person is aiming for. Right? And same for looking between different sorts of people. So here we can see on this chart, um, Men generally, right, on average are bigger than women. Women are generally bigger than children. So the size of the vocal tract is different, which means that the way that we make vowels is also different, just biologically, right? We find differences along these as well. This is a really old study from the 50s, but it makes the point pretty well. But the point that I want to leave you with here, right, and that as language users, it's fun to look at this. I think it's a useful tool. I'll come back to that at the end for if you're trying to do language learning. But the really cool thing about this to me is that we basically figure this out immediately without really trying, right? If you're talking with somebody else who's like an English speaker, particularly from your area, and there's not like a dialectal difference, right? These biological differences, they just wash out. You don't notice. Somebody says, ah, slightly differently from you. You don't have a problem with placing what category that should fall into, right? Same with all of these sounds, all right? Even if you're talking with somebody who um, has a dialectal difference or speak is like a non this also works out pretty quickly. Like if you're trying, you will figure out what that person is saying pretty quickly, right? I'm assuming all of you have examples of this, experience of this on your own, yeah? If you're trying, right, you don't, it won't take you very long, and for most cases, you don't even need to try. We just adapt to it for the most part. And so this comes to talking about second language acquisition and acquisition more generally, all right? Because I figured, given the audience, you would be interested in that. So how do we acquire new languages, all right? It really depends on how old you are and how many languages you've been exposed to already. So babies, if you expose a, like as Alan was saying before, a baby exposed for about, you know, a third of its time to a particular language will pick up that language, right? Just through the regular exposure, no further teaching is really necessary. Children, um, can pick up languages often just through exposure as well, and they often have like really dramatic, like grammatical flips, right? There's a really good study, for example, um, of a Turkish kid living in England who was a friend of like the researcher, or was a kid of the researcher's friend, yes. Um, and basically one day went from Turkish, which is totally, the verb comes at the end of the sentence after the object, right? It's very strictly head final. Right, so you, instead of having like into, in the room, you have the room in, et cetera, right? Um, one day, like between sessions like six and seven, he just flips. He's like, and now he's like, oh, English doesn't do that. English goes the other way and just starts doing English totally the other way, right? It's not gradual. He's just sort of like, oh, this is English, I guess. I'm doing it this way now, right? So you find this sort of thing in children. Adults um, do have a good number of benefits, right? It's much faster for us for learning vocabulary. We have a lot of other domain general, like learning skills that we can put to learning language, but there are also some challenges as well. Um, again, probably, I personally know this, probably you do too. Um, and this is because, at least to some extent, of transfer, right? So depending on the grammatical features of your first language, right, what you find happening in your second language can differ. Right? So the ways that like somebody who's a, like as a, 
English speaker learning Japanese, as I did, right, the mistakes that I made in Japanese were different from my, like when I was studying in Japan, I had a lot of Chinese friends who were studying Japanese, right, they made a different set of mistakes in Japanese than I did, right? Um, and it really makes a difference just for the sorts of mistakes you find, depending on what you have to begin with. So just, and you find it totally across the spectrum, right? All different parts of linguistics, all the different like modules of dealing with language, you can find these sorts of transfer um, issues, okay? So for phonology, for example, English, okay? Um, so in English, target like have, right? All of this is an IPA. If you're a French speaker, right? You don't have H in French, so it's harder to sort of pick this out, but you do have V, and you can put a V at the end of the word, that's not a problem, so you'll say something like av, right? Probably you have heard this if you've been living in Montreal. Wow, it's so quiet, okay. <laughs> On the other hand, if you're a German speaker, putting an H at the beginning of the word, really easy, okay? You have H, totally fine for you to put it at the beginning of a word, but you don't have voice sounds like V at the end of words, right? German has a rule that says if you have a voice sound at the end of the word, then you turn it to an unvoiced sound. So V turns to, to F, right? And so you'll have half instead of have, right? So depending on where you're coming from, you'll get different sort of effects for this. I don't want to sort of be picking on going into English. I know um, you find this a lot for like tu, right? U doesn't exist in English, so you'll find a lot of English speakers including me for like tu instead of to, right, for the second person pronoun, right? And similarly, depending on what language you're coming from, you're going to fix syllables that are not good in your first language in different ways for your second language, right? So a Spanish speaker learning English, you can't have sp at the beginning, right, of a syllable, so you're gonna say something like I speak Spanish, right? So you're going to fix this by putting like a little vowel in front of the S that resolves the problem Right? But a similar thing for Japanese to English, right? you can't have st in Spanish or in um, Japanese, but for Japanese, the way you fix it is by putting vowels in between rather than one at the beginning. So like strawberries will become storoberi, right? Okay? One of the most interesting things to me is that even different dialects of the same language can lead to different phonological outcomes, like the thing that you're going to produce ends up being different depending on what variety of the language you speak. So there's a re some really interesting research from somebody who teaches at UCAM, who shows that for Quebec French speakers learning English, the the sound, that th sound um, that you have in English and very common like the, there, et cetera, right? If you're a Quebec French speaker, it usually turns to a D, so you'll get go over there. If you're a European French speaker, it'll turn to Z, right? So go over there. And there's a lot of analysis about why this might be happening, um, but it's a really interesting thing. They're both French, Right? But the varieties of French being different has led to the repair strategy being different. So knife, French doesn't have the either way, but what you decide to do with the the, right, is different depending on what variety of French you came from, which I think is super fascinating. And this is why I, I, second language acquisition was my thing. <laughs> um, so you find this sort of stuff, false friends, you've probably run into before. So Spanish speakers and English, my wife is embarrassed, meaning pregnant or going the other way. You're saying that you're embarrassed in Spanish and you're accidentally saying you're pregnant. Um, I think it's happened to every Spanish speaker that, like every English learner of Spanish that I know has made this mistake at some point. Um, I got this at the apartment store. Um, this is sort of a dep, but it's, uh, you know, not the place that sells you apartments. <laughs> um, morphological stuff that happens in other languages if you're in a language that ha matches tense, right, across the different verbs. So he didn't won the race, right? Totally grammatical in a, um, your big language like um, Turkish, not good for um, a language like English. Same for sort of figuring out where you're supposed to put the morphology on things like particle verbs, right? You can see this for syntax stuff as well. So he drinks frequently beer, right? Again, in French, you put the um, adverb generally after the verb. In English, you put it before. Um, so this is just transferred over. Right, um, resumptive pronouns, pronouns and relative clauses like Turkish learners of English. There's the lady that I met her yesterday, right? There are a couple of varieties of English that use these sorts of pronouns as well, but uh, in most varieties of English we don't, but you'll find second language learners doing it. Um, even semantics, this is an experiment that I did. So he didn't eat the carrot or the pepper in English. Um, what does that mean? How many vegetables did they, he eat in this context? Zero, one, two, 
If he didn't eat the carrot or the pepper, then he didn't eat either of them, right? Yeah. In Japanese, if you say he didn't eat the carrot or the pepper, that means he ate one or the other of them, but not both. Okay? And so you'll find Japanese, even really advanced Japanese learners of English will still make this mistake, right? Um, because I mean, the evidence that's going to tell you that you're doing it wrong is pretty weak, and it's not taught ever. Nobody's really, I went through a lot of Japanese textbooks for English to find whether anybody ever talks about it. They don't really. If you're writing a Japanese textbook for English, this is a good thing to stick in. Um, probably they will thank you. Um, but yeah, so all across it, you can find all these different things, right? All of these different sort of areas of transfer. Um, most of them are things that you can overcome. Like these are things, I, I, they're not meant to be sort of, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or to, like, I, just this is part of learning a second language as an adult. You have to deal with transfer, right? of a lot of different kinds, and I think it helps to be aware of it. So I think that, like, this is part of my point here for what I wanted to finish, Pierre. There's so much stuff going on in language. There's so many different things for you to engage with, and if you're the sort of person who's at a place like this and you're interested in learning a lot of different languages, right, you don't have to know a lot of different languages to be a linguist, but I think that knowing linguistics helps you learn more languages, right, because it gives you a sense of what's possible and what different languages do, how you can structure things, right, in your speech, right, in your syntax, in the interpretations that you get, right. I know when I started learning linguistics, I, I did a double major in Japanese and linguistics, and I started with Japanese, I had a year of Japanese before I started doing any linguistics, and there were things that if I were told, like, this is the way that you pronounce the fu sound, it is a um, voiceless bilabial fricative, right, so you put your lips close together and you don't have any vibration. If somebody had told me that, rather than, it's kind of like an F, but not quite, which is what my Japanese teachers actually told me about that sound, right? it would have been helpful. Right? And there's a whole bunch of different things like this. If you know more about linguistics, I think it helps, it informs your language learning, and the more languages that you know, the easier it is to sort of do more stuff with linguistics. Right? Like, there's so much going on, there's so much that's fascinating, there's a lot to play with. Okay? Um, Similarly, like why you, you decided to get interested in language, what your goals are with it, right? This varies from person to person. I have find languages inherently really interesting, um, hence all the time that I've spent on studying both the structure of them and the languages themselves, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm trying to be like, oh, you should go and become a professional linguist now, right? In the same way where I wouldn't be like, you know, your goal should be to go out and learn like 12 different languages, okay? You know what you want to get out of this, right? I think linguistics is fascinating. I think it's a useful tool for you, right, if you want to be learning more, but you decide what you want to get out of it. I think that you should just play with it. And so to that end, there's so much stuff you can do that's free tools for you to play around with, right, that are the same things that professional linguists use that are writing like research papers, that have PhDs, that are publishing books, right? The phonetic software that I use to make sort of the charts right, and that people use for doing phonetics experiments is Pratt, it's free, right, it's at this website. Whoops, we'll move you over to here. There's the not judging your grammar, just analyzing it t-shirt. So Pratt, you can just go here, you can download it, and you can make as many spectrograms, you can play around with phonetics, you can see the way that you're making sounds and whether it's the way, you can download sound files from other people and sort of see what sounds you can make from it and how it compares to the sounds that you're seeing. There's so much you can do with Pratt. If you want to do like, psych like psycholinguistic studies, if you want to play around with like how you interpret language, this is a free tool. People use this for, again, like published research for making language processing experiments. It's a little bit harder than Prot um, because you do need to know a bit of coding to play around with it, but not that much, right? You can learn to do these things pretty easily, okay? And I think that like if you're somebody who's interested in language, it's a good idea, right? Go and play around with it, see what appeals to you, right? Learn more about these things because it's going to inform the other stuff that you're interested in. And there's so many other resources. There's videos like our series, Link Space we've been doing for years. Uh, we said at the outset we have like well over 100 videos, lots of different topics all across linguistics. And they're things that are meant to sort of get you more interested in the topic. None of them are like the end, right? We try to give you a good introduction to what's going on with it so that you have the, like, enough of an idea to go and do other stuff. Right? Same with like, there's blogs. Linguistics Tumblr is really good. There's a lot of really good like stuff happening on Tumblr for linguistics. Um, 
My friend Gretchen, who was here earlier, has a podcast called Ling Enthusiasm. Very good. That's where the t-shirts are from. Um, there's just so much out there for playing with linguistics. I think linguists really want people to be more aware of what's going on with language. And you guys are an ideal audience for it, right? You're already interested in language, right? If you're at this talk, you probably are already interested in linguistics to some degree. So go and play with it, right? I think that that's the best approach, right? So with that, I am about out of time. So we'll get to the question period. So thank you so much for coming. If you want um, linkspace.com, we have all the videos. And um, also, if you go to the YouTube channel, if you want, there's extra material stuff, like about a bunch of the videos on the website, too. We're at the link space on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. We don't really use Instagram much, but we have the account. Um, I'm not really into taking pictures much, um, even though I am on video a lot now. It's kind of weird. Anyway, you can find us on all of those places. And thanks again for coming out. And um, yeah, let's uh, see what you guys have for questions. Thanks. Yeah, please subscribe. Man, I'm bad at YouTube. I should be saying this sort of thing to like five times a day. Um, so um, I'm supposed to give microphones so that we can get it recorded. Maybe we can. I'm going to run up to you is what I'm going to do, because we'll save time that way. So here you go. What is your question? Hello. There we go. Um, my question is about the uh, Canadian raising. So we say out and about the house. You guys down south say out and about the house down south. And I was just wondering um, what, what, uh, holy crap, totally forgot my question. <laughs> Give me a sec. Um, I had two questions about it. Yeah, what, um, do you think that the Canadian uh, vowel raising is spreading across the states? Because I read that it was becoming more prominent in California. And I notice in some TV shows, more modern TV shows that I watch, it's difficult to distinguish between whether or not they're saying out or out. It's an excellent question. And I'm going to start by just a personal sort of anecdote where I was teaching a phonetics class here at Concordia. And I was like, I don't have Canadian raising. Um, and so I can force myself to do Canadian raising. So I was sort of like, oh, so it, up here, we would say something like right, but in the US, we'd say something like right, and people were like, no, that was the same thing. And I realized I'd been living here long enough that the I one has actually changed for me, <laughs> but the owl one hasn't. Um, so this is a, overall, it's a, language is still changing right now. I think if you go and you look at um, stuff from even like a few decades ago, like TV from the 50s and 60s, or like movie, like if you watch like Casablanca or something, right? You'll notice that this sort of speech in that, even though it's still English, even though it's still North American English, it's already like tangibly different, the way that people say things. Um, even more so, I think if you read books from like those eras, like you don't have to go all the way back to like Shakespeare where you're sort of like, I don't really know what's going on here. Like you can read like The Catcher in the Rye and be like, people don't talk like this anymore, right? There are ongoing vowel shifts that are happening in the US now. There's particularly a big one happening around in the Great Lakes region, um, but it's not really matching Canadian raising. What we would expect if it was really like Canadian raising itself happening in California, that would either we would expect there's a lot of people from Canada moving to California, like enough to sort of influence that, or alternatively, we would expect that maybe um, there's a lot of like Canadian influence on, like just suddenly like all of the popular movies and TV and music and whatever are made in Canada, which some of it is, but not all of it. Um, so different um, languages or different dialects can converge on the same thing without it being from the same root, right? So you can kind of ha see the same vowel shifts that have occurred over time. Like you can see the same things happening and because the mechanisms that drive these sorts of changes are the same. Right? So this, if you have a particular pressure on the lang like on a dialect or on a language, you will see the sorts of changes happening in those as well. So if, you, if you're interested in historical linguistic stuff, we do have a couple of videos about it. But yeah, the, this sort of change, this is what's interesting about sociolinguistic stuff really for now, because sociolinguistic stuff is basically like current historical linguistics. <laughs> Right? It's the things that are happening now that in like 50 years or 100 years, people are going to look back at it and be like, wow, look at this vowel shift that happened. Right? But you get to figure it out now. Right? Yeah. Yep. I will run over that way.
Oh, you've already got a microphone. Even better. We're ready. Save me some exercise. <laughs> The question is, as an academic discipline, you see sure. references to linguistics and you see references to applied linguistics, mm -hmm. which to my mind always beg the question, what are unapplied linguistics? But in terms of academic discipline, what is the difference between linguistics and applied linguistics? So generally, the difference that we see between them is it, when people make a distinction between linguistics and applied linguistics, what's underneath it is usually that non-applied linguistics is theoretical linguistics. So stuff like um, looking across like different languages to see like what syntactic patterns are possible or what interpretations are possible and, or like phonology, like what sound patterns are possible, different things that seem to underlie, like rules that you want to say maybe are part of a universal grammar. Um, whether you believe in universal grammar or not, I do personally, but it's not an argument. We can talk about some other point if you would, well, we can talk about some other point if you want. I think there's probably not enough time in this question session to talk about it now. But that's generally the difference, is that stuff that you're using for education, stuff that you're using for language processing, practice, those are applied ones, because you're taking stuff from linguistics and you're using it, right? Theoretical linguistics is usually you're looking across a lot of languages and then proposing okay, this is the way that I think language writ large is on the basis of the data that I have. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, no, on a microphone. <laughs> uh, so along the same lines as vowel change, like mm -hmm. the progression of vowels, um, you notice that in like every country, like the South has a very strong accent and there are some places that almost have a non-existent accent and then there, the North has an existent accent. I guess along the lines of linguistics, like how is that, I don't really even know how to ask it, how is that developed? Like how does it that, typically the South has an accent and typically the North has an accent? So, I mean, this is an interesting question. Yeah, like I think that one of the things that you talk about when you get into sociolinguistics research is that everybody has an accent, right? To the people that are living in the South in the US or who are living in, you know, northern Quebec, or whatever sort of region you're looking in that you think has an accent, think that you have an accent, right? If you go there, they'll be like, oh, you sound like you're from somewhere else, right? So it's all relative, okay? Um, what makes these sort of like dialects develop? This is sort of a, you know, language communities that are sort of developed, like, you know, grow over time. Even if you start from sort of the same base, if you're living in different geographical regions, um, language acquisition is, is imperfect. We don't speak the language the same way that our parents spoke, and we certainly don't speak it the same way our grandparents spoke, right? So you see these things changing over time. Therefore, if you have geographical differences and people aren't interacting, they'll just develop in different ways. That's how you end up with like different dialects, um, indeed how you end up with different languages in some cases. Um, so that's how that divides. In terms of like why some areas have stronger accents, I think that this, is, this actually mostly comes down to um, a question of what are more standard versus non-standard, and that's just a social distinction. From a linguistics point of view, um, it doesn't like, all, all, everything is equal, right? Um, all languages that are sort of like put together by, you know, people, by the systems that we have in our head are legit equal, right? We don't view them as any one of them being better than another. Um, that's more of a social construct, right? So we might say like, you know, if you're somebody who's speaking like, you know, upper middle class, like New York English, that that sounds more, or like like the received pronunciation, very posh sounding British accent sounds better than like a Cockney accent, but you know, yeah, yeah. But this is something that it's not a linguistics thing, it's a social thing, yeah. I mean, it's totally worthy of research, but it's not, yeah. Hi. 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 Um, along a related topic, my, my question is about how do you as a linguist make the distinction between um, a language and a dialect? Because I know people talk about a, a language or having a, a language having an army and a navy and a dialect right. doesn't. Because some dialects are really, really different. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think that is exactly what it comes, usually within linguistics, the dividing line that we usually like to talk about is mutual intelligibility. So um, if you can understand, if two speakers of two different dialects can't understand each other, then from a linguistics perspective, we would prefer to say that those are two different languages, right? Whereas if they're two different languages, but um, the people can understand each other, we would usually prefer to treat that as two dialects of the same one. But these really are political distinctions, right? So you can see, like Hindi and Urdu 
um, are usually mutually intelligible, but because that's basically India versus Pakistan and that's very politically sensitive, they are separate languages. But you'll often see them discussed in the linguistics literature like as one because they're basically mutually intelligible and therefore we want to treat them that way, as opposed to Chinese where there's a lot of different languages in there, but politically China wants to be like, this is all the same. Right? But it's not like you could be a speaker of like Hokkien and then sort of be like, well, Mandarin makes perfect sense to me. But they're still both Chinese because there's one China, right? So mutual intelligibility is usually the mark, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one short question. Very short. Okay. I won't forget this one. All right, great. <laughs> um, so my grandparents are from Great Britain, mm -hmm. and um, I was just wondering, like, now that I'm 20, is there any possibility I can accurately pick up the accent and be able to switch between my Canadian accent and a Great British accent? Sure. I mean, it really is a matter of how much time and effort you want to put into it. The nice thing about the two of them that you're talking about is that almost all of the sounds are the same, so you don't really need to learn. The thing that's most challenging as sort of like an adult's past, you know, like early 20s-ish, is really like learning phonological distinctions that don't exist in your language um, to the degree that for some of, like L versus R for like a Japanese speaker of English, et cetera. Like those sorts of things are very hard because those are one category in your um, first language, right, if you're a Japanese speaker, but in your second language, you need to divide them, um, and that turns out to be really hard. Um, bordering on impossible, depends on who you ask. I just think it's really hard, because I, but we can talk about that afterwards if you want. Um, because most of the sounds are in common, because you're still sort of at an age where you can be sensitive to the process, like, I would say personally, like, if that's really your goal, that you want to be able to do that, like, you should be, like, fo and I think this goes for learning languages in general, personally. Like, if it's really important to you to try to achieve a native accent and you're still in that age range, like, more than focusing on the grammar and stuff, like, focus on pronunciation and prosody, because that's what's going to get you there. Like, eventually, you're not going to be able to hear the differences, really, so people are going to be, like, this one versus that one, you're going to be, like, I don't know, right? If you're still sensitive to it at this point, um, it, it's not that it is impossible for older people to do it, but like it just gets harder and harder over time, right? So if you're at a point where you really care about that, right, and like some people really like if they speak with an accent, it doesn't bother them, I think that's totally fine too. Like everybody has different goals, right? But if you want to be speaking like in a way where you don't really have um, an accent or you want to have speak in a different dialect with an accurate accent for that place, like you can do it, right? But you have to really focus on that to not to the exclusion of other things necessarily, but really have that be your main focus in learning would be my personal belief, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I think that's all we have time. Thanks again to everyone for coming. If you have any questions, I'll be around. And please check out my channel. <laughs>